Hello and welcome to the Performance Podcast, streaming live on Wednesday the 10th of February. And joining me in this edition, Ed Selly. I only use it for medicinal purposes. Kaz Harlow. I've done far worse than kill you. I've hurt you. And Greg Hook. Don't believe in a no-win scenario. I'm so very, very tired. Welcome back. <laughs> it's the podcast. We're streaming live again this evening. Uh, it is a Wednesday. We, we'd either... Um, in a level two of 2021, or we are 2020, the extended edition, one or the other, you, you choose. Um, still in lockdown, still got 70s here, haven't bothered to to take the, the snips to them yet. Uh, that will be coming, I think, in the next few weeks. Uh, so welcome back. Welcome to the podcast. We've got a team assembled. Um, we are going to talk lots of stuff tonight, but before mm. we do that, Ed, what have you been doing this week? Um, I have just been uh, continuing in the standard lockdown vein of um, working. Uh, I have uh, experimented with, as I say, just trying to broaden the retinue of things I've been cooking. Uh, I've been experimenting with some different versions of lentils. That doesn't sound exciting, but I do like what you can get done with lentils. You put the effort in. So I've been doing that. And um, hardware related, but I didn't want to discuss it in the hardware section. Last night, I did the big update to Rune version 1.8, which is the uh, biggest changes they've made in many, many years. So um, uh, I uh, updated that last night, been shaking it down and uh, just having a look over it. Um, it's, it's quite impressive. Uh, if you are uh, in the incredibly small subset of... Uh, because it doesn't appear to be a big deal on AV forums. Indeed, it's not a huge deal anyway. Uh, if you are a classical music fan and you have curated content of classical music and you have been frustrated at how uh, music playback software has butchered um, composer, conductor, and all the other metadata that you so exactingly put in, it's probably time to spend out on Rune because 1.8 has done some incredible things in terms of trying to make classical music work in a search sense. So that is largely um, what I've been doing because I don't know if you, I think you, you touched on this, Phil. There's not a lot else to do. It's no, grinding. I, 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 I'm seriously, this week, I've seriously been climbing the walls. I really have. And I'm so bored that I can't even be bothered to sit down and watch a movie. So I can't even be bothered with that. <laughs> I'm at that stage now where, yeah, really impatient, really just... Uh, and, of course, I got I got the news this week that my car's been delayed. So, again, oh. not, not that it makes any difference. <laughs> no. <laughs> ain't going anywhere in it. Um, but still, I, I think I've just... I've got myself all built up for the is this car. this chip shortage it is a microprocessor shortage so um i mean so, it yeah. is ironic that the ford a ford mustang has been delayed by a shortage of technology <laughs> um, because for most of the lifespan of the car that's not been a big deal but yeah. uh obviously well, it's, it's, a, a it's affecting world. all car manufacturers some have except to toyota them. because it would appear that toyota bought all the chips that everyone else is planning on using. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's some lights that have been offline for months on end, no cars getting built. So, yeah. So, hopefully, it won't be too much longer. And we, I think we're only talking about a couple of weeks, maybe three week delay. So, it only pushes things back a little bit. So, as long as it's here for the summer, I'll be happy. Um, but that's, that's what's been going on in my world. Not a lot else. I've uh, been making my way through the expanse. I'm doing two episodes a night on that on the projector when I can. Um, finished with the Arkham. Been, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. And um, yeah, uh, TV is supposed to get delivered this week. So I was expecting an LG B10, which is the entry level LG TV. Um, and it tends to overlap the B10. So it tends to come out a bit later than the other models and overlap into the, the newer models. But of course, um, with the weather, and of course, it's been snowing up here for the last two weeks on and off, and uh, it's blizzards outside at the minute. Um, the poor courier guy that has to drive from uh, all the way down there in, in England land, south in England land, all the way up here <laughs> to northern land. Um, it was a bit risky, and I, I said, look, don't risk it uh, this week. We can wait till next week. There's no rush. We're not going anywhere. So, so yeah, uh, that's a little bit of a delay. But apart from that, not a lot else. What have you been doing, Greg? Wow. A very interesting week. I've been going to work, then coming back home, having dinner, going to sleep, then going to work again the next day. So been doing that all week so far, and it's very exciting. Yeah, but at least you're getting out of your prison cell. <laughs> yes. Yeah, at least I'm actually going outside for a couple of seconds and then getting in the car 
driving to work and then getting outside for a couple more seconds. So, to yeah. be honest, you don't want to be outside for that long at the moment. No, uh, it's, I mean, it's heated, crazy. Heated, heated seats. What a glorious invention. Oh, yes. And heated steering wheel. As well. Oh, you saucy, <laughs> saucy minx. My dad's got a heated steering wheel. It's one of those things you think that's absolutely pointless and humanity is going to fall. Even, and then you actually go, actually, that's no, brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Even a Mustang has one, Ed. Oh. Why me? Excellent. Although you, you, I always get the feeling that that's done, but that, that they do that, but it's like an induction thing. They, they, there's a metal <laughs> ring inside it, just forces an enormous amount of electric current in there, you know, just to <laughs> <Yeah>. induction hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so exciting lives all around. Uh, mm. So let's move on to cars because cars have been doing something exciting. I tell you what, I've been doing for the first time in like twenty years of collecting and reviewing and whatever else. Uh, okay. I've been pruning my collection. Ooh, this is a bold move. Thousand discs got rid of. Thousand. That's quite. That's quite a prune. <laughs> yeah. So you got what a fiver. For them? <laughs> uh, oh yeah no you, you can't really shift many of them i got 140 quid um what a return on investment eh no not really but, but yeah I mean, presumably these but, are mind you, a lot a lot of those will be uh you know pr discs and stuff as well wouldn't they well you can't you know no none of them are pr discs because you can't, can't obviously sell pr discs but um <laughs> are you the only guy yeah. that reads the label and the things and not for resale, not for resale. <laughs> oh, okay then <laughs> no no i get i get the little press discs i don't get the not for resale i get the it's just a press disc they send me so i can't really do a great deal with that presumably Kaz, the stuff that you pruned is it where you or you have a, a copy of it in in a higher format You've not um, actually physically got rid of. St- oh, you've physically got rid of stuff. You have no other. You have no other means of. Yeah, five hundred DVDs and five hundred Blu-rays, give or take. Just Blimey. nothing. Things that I just didn't think I was ever going to watch again. And sacrilegious as it is, if I wanted to, I'd probably sooner stick it on Netflix than dig it out the cupboard. Oh, <laughs> you know, it's fair. So, so I'm yeah. not talking about heat. I'm not talking about like. Films that I think uh, in my, I would say, go so far as to say my top 500. I would think that I've probably got so, a so thousand, no seagull. You I've got a, no <laughs> seagull, no. I've got a thousand discs still going, and 500 of those I think are never going to go anywhere. Um, but uh, but the others, I've got so many things that I don't know why. <laughs> I, I don't I know why don't I paid money for them. You know, I don't know why I've got every single John Travolta movie. I don't know. I don't know why I've got every single Morgan Freeman movie. So, you, so... You, you say that. I mean, I got rid of my DVDs so on, quite a number of years ago now, and it was amazing how many I'd, I'd actually collected and had the boxes. And that, that must have been well over a thousand that I got yeah. rid of. Yeah. So I, I never got rid of the DVDs. I took them out of their cases, painstakingly put them in uh, CD wallets, and put them in the garage. Ten years later they're going in the bin. <laughs> so <laughs> I literally have never opened them. I was opening them and go, what? Why do it's I have... It's a binning phase, yeah. Why, yeah. why do I have these movies? So, yeah, I mean... But I, I've gotten to the stage now, Kaz, now that you mentioned that. I mean, I used to buy loads of DVDs every week. I'd buy five yeah. or six DVDs because they were coming out all the time. And I'd spent a fortune. My dis- uh, disposable income went on, on disc. Mm-hmm. I have bought one 4K UHD Blu-ray in the last six months. And there's loads out there that in the past I would have bought them. You know, things like the Back to the Future trilogy, the Star Wars box and all the rest of it. And I've got to the point now where, oh, hang on a minute, I've got Disney Plus so I can watch all the Star Wars stuff in 4K HDR. I don't need the discs. You know, that's 200 quid. Do I need to spend 200 quid on that? Or yeah. and, and I've started looking at it that way, which as an AV enthusiast, I never thought I would get to the stage where... Um, I was uh, reticent to spend money on on a physical format. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm. I go on. Greg. Yeah, I was going to say I'm the same. In fact, on the forums, I've I've posted replies, sort of saying that I'll never get rid of discs. I'll always be using discs. But like Phil, I haven't bought a a 4K for quite some time, um, and there's some I want, but I just think, well, they just go on Netflix or Disney Plus, which is something I'd never, you know, I always wanted the actual disc. But it's just, it's like, you know. Yeah. yeah. And I think some of them, away I've, from I've bought them in, on so many different formats. Well, there is that. Yes. There's you, you, a degree of weariness sets in. Whereas if, yep. like me, you specialize in buying something on an obsolete medium to begin with, hmm. 
you uh, you get around that. But to head you off on an inevitable question, Phil, I do sell records. At any given time, I have about 15 or 20 albums listed on Discogs for sale, because if someone genuinely wants to pay me that much money for them, they are welcome to them. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> It's yeah, not. well, it it it, it, it there's uh, like you like you said with films, there's certain things that I will I will never sell. They have sentimental value, or they're simply magnificent albums. But then there's other things where I bought them at the right time. I bought them new. I paid between fifteen or twenty pounds. If someone genuinely wants to pay me over a hundred pounds for that record, fill your boots. But you're lucky because they've gone up in value. Well, there is that, yes. So that uh, but not everything. Uh, not every piece of vinyl does that. But it does de- generally depreciate more gracefully than, than, yes. than DVDs yeah, the, do. <laughs> I, I would say the only ones that I've, I've been quite pleasantly surprised by are my steelbooks. Because I went through a real steelbook phase. And, and shifting those has, has been pleasant in some hmm. cases. Yes, they're really going to pay 50 quid for something that I spent a fiver on from Zavi. Mm. so um again but, you've got to be in uh if you if you want the uh, uh, do you remember uh Ath- the band athlete they did an album called tourist and it's not a bad album but i bought that uh because it was on a two for 30 pounds offer uh in hmv and i sold it to a gentleman in germany for 180 pounds yeah uh, nice <laughs> if he wants to buy if he wants to enjoy athlete at 180 pounds then he can fill his boots i bought a cd from a charity shop uh ripped it and i can enjoy it in much the same way so yeah it, it's all about it's as you say it's about priorities and and certain things uh even if we don't value them they develop a value all of their own yeah good stuff uh, martin Gillespie, he's just donated five pounds thank has. you very much uh, martin he's got a question for you ed i've read it uh, martin congratulations on buying a magnificent turntable for now, those that for those that are listening and not watching ed can you just a, think, he it, martin has bought a denon dp47 turntable from japan it's not new uh he will have imported a used model from japan if you do a google image search for dp 47 f you will be confronted with its magnificence because uh, Denon uh, made a spate of truly brilliant record players uh, all the way through the 70s and early 80s. Actually, into the late 80s when I think about it. Uh, uh, Martin has asked about a phono stage that will um, uh, enhance the performance of the turntable over and above the one in his Morant 7012. Uh, this is going to sound like an incredible setup, but it's not. We didn't prompt this question. Believe it or not, the first ever AV Forums phono stage review is in the tank, ready to go up on the site. Um, and uh, it's for uh, the latest of the IFI Zen series of products. We've already looked at the Bluetooth DAC and the uh, standard DAC. This is the Zen phono. Uh, it's £150. Um, and uh, I don't want to, obviously, don't want to completely negate the review, but Martin, it's astonishing. I simply haven't experienced anything under four hundred pounds in as a phono stage that gets anywhere near it. It will do both moving magnet and moving coil. It's got it, it's got some really smart components in it. It's incredibly quiet, huge amounts of gain if you need it. Uh, it's small and easy to use, uh, and it's unquestionably brilliant. If you have more than four hundred pounds to spend, uh, you might want to have a look at um, the project rs series phono stages they're good at that point but honestly for a sensible sum of money the ifi zen phono uh that sort of spoils what the review is going to be like but i was staggered at how good it was he says he's in you've sold it well done there you go there you go <laughs> lots of people talking about having selling their uh, the dvd box sets and so on and vhs thx editions of the original star wars trilogy i had that box as well somewhere um well i got rid of it years ago that's the thing some things i wish i'd never gotten rid of um like that um 40 cents this is john feel funny uh, i paid uh, 89 pounds for avatar 3d <laughs> All because he didn't have a panasonic tv well it was an exclusive on the panasonic i remember TV. that well um so yeah i think there was there's quite a bit of scalping going on back then for copies of that so uh, unfortunately you lost out on that because yeah <laughs> <laughs> I believe, though, it still bizarrely has it, it does have some level of resale value amongst the um, 
It will do. I don't want to, I don't want to refer not, to Not the, 90 the, quid's worth. Though. No, no, no. It, it, depreciation will have taken place. Just perhaps not as much depreciation as many of the other 3D Blu-rays. Yeah, and of course, Avatar rumoured to be Cameron's first 4K UHD Blu-ray in a long time to be released. Ahead of the ones that we want. So <laughs> okay. We yeah. won't mention them. We won't mention no, them. No, no, because yeah. it's like some it's like 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 saying Beetlejuice a couple of times. You know, well, <laughs> Steve isn't supposed to be on this podcast, but he will be inside of inside of 90 seconds. <laughs> but yes. uh, yeah, okay. So um talking about stuff like that, let's give you some stuff that you can then sell on if you want, or you can <laughs> win it and, and use it. Uh current competitions, cars, what can we win? <laughs> Yes, uh, so we have a Denon Home Soundbar 550. It's a good um, thing. Yep, worth 599. It's a shame it's not worth 550. They missed a beat on that one. Uh, we also got a bunch of 4K Blu ray competitions, including Ely- Elysium in 4K, Criterion's February Blu ray titles, Batman Soul of the Dragon, and Mask of the Red Death, uh, and a copy in, of 2012 in 4K and Star Trek Picard Season 1 on Blu ray. It's available exclusively for our patrons. Head over to avforums.com slash competitions to enter. All competitions open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. Um, we have previous competition winter winners. Um, Drongo, a previous competition winner, had some very kind words to say about us. So we're going to read that out. And, and we didn't pay him. No. We, did, we didn't pay him <laughs> other than in competition prices. But <laughs> we, it's... Uh, I would be grateful if you could kindly convey my sincere thanks and gratitude to all those who run and contribute to AV forums for this competition and for all their hard work in keeping the forum running. The forum is far more than just a resource. It's a community, which I appreciate being part of. It's- oh, thanks very much, Strongo. Thank that you. I appreciate really it. Nice. Yes. And, and you're right, it is a community. Um, and it's it, we're always happy to have you guys along and... Uh, get your stories find out what you're doing and where we can help out we'll we'll help out so um that's competitions and that's what we've been up to we'll be back in a second with some hardware if you'd like to support the av forums podcast on a regular basis then why not become a patron head over to patreon.com forward slash av forums to sign up you can also make a one-off donation through the super chat or via streamlabs.com forward slash av forums all donations help us to improve the website and the podcasts. Thank you to all our supporters. So just before we talk about hardware this week, uh, some donations since we were last live, uh, people to mention. So uh, Michael Walter, uh, Dan Bartram, Brian Bernard and Slinky Wizard, they all became patrons this week. Thank you very much for your support. It really is appreciated. Uh, David Nemo's donated another £10. David keeps doing this. Thank you very much, David. Mm -hmm. It really is uh, appreciated. He says, hello, guys. Sorry for my spell mistake last week on the film questions. Um, And then he makes an inappropriate joke that I'm not going to read out. (laughs) Uh, Thanks to Ed for a great write-up. B&W Signature question to all you guys. What would be your dream 5.1 system, just the speakers and AVR? Your budget is 20 grand. Thanks for replying to my last question. You're more than welcome, David. I'll answer quite quickly because uh, for me, it would be, if it's a 5.1 system, it'd be MK MP300s uh, with the uh, NAD T778. That brings it in bang on 20 grand. That's what. Nice. Off the top of my head, that's what I would go with. Uh, Ed. Um, I would be very tempted to also go with the T778, uh, but I would most likely go for, and I think I just about squeak in under budget, five of the ATC HTS 40 on wall speakers. So they're five identical. So it's a similar principle to what you've just done, Phil. Uh, you get five identical driver arrays all the way around. It, it's just a big it's it's got the atc sort of um get up and go to it uh so yeah that that would be that would be how i'd do it because if i actually had to i could probably even still install it in this room uh assuming that i'd ha- i'd spent the 20 pounds on that and not uh, 20 grand on that and not had anything else to uh, not had any cha- change of scene so uh, that that too okay cuz <laughs> Oh, I don't have anything to say about that. 
What the answer is, I'd need to do some research for Paris would I spend think. it all on Blu rays to then sell at vastly, de- vastly depreciated. Yeah, I'll, 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 spend, uh, I'll spend it on Blu rays and then sell them for, for 50p. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if that's if that's on the cards, then I'll do that. Although uh, you know, you say that how how would the hardware depreciate? But um, the speaker's not too bad. Speaker's we have to be really completely right, yeah. honest about the fact that AV Electronics um, uh, things are actually improving because p- manufacturers are leaving stuff alone for more than one year. Yeah, the they're, sudden, well, they're suddenly noticing that all of a sudden this actually generates a level of demand for things beyond just the group of in- incredible diehards that change stuff very often it's um it, it it you know long may this continue jvc denon people like that they have they are leading the way in reintroducing a degree of actual long-term worth to av products and long may it continue yeah good stuff um okay greg what's yours um, I'd have to do some research. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd probably use the twenty grand to buy a load of Nvidia thirty eighties, and then, and then sell, sell scalp them, them, scalp them, and sell them at massive. To be markup. honest, I, that's still more socially acceptable because I thought there was a horrible off chance that you're going to say I was going to going to start Bitcoin mining. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, mm. so yes, good. <laughs> David, hopefully uh, that answers your question. And again, thank you very much for your temper and donation. It really is appreciated. Pulp Fiction, yet again, supporting us. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for that. Donated £10. It says, thanks for answering my question last week. Uh, it was a good discussion. Any thoughts on Class D AVRs? There don't seem to be many out there. Well, I've just mentioned the T778. Yeah. Uh, it's a digital chassis. Fantastic. Uh, one of the best out there, I think. And um, I haven't seen many others. So Pioneer yeah, do a couple, um, okay. but we don't necessarily see those as often, do we? No, no, we don't. Um, but they do. Uh, at the moment, uh, it's uh, people get into this weird mindset of assuming that because you just buy the module, that there's no other work involved in it. But of course there is. So the, the brands that have been pushing ahead and been doing it for some years, NAD, um, Pioneer and so on and so forth, uh, they they have some advantages over people who are trying to just come into it cold because it's not just a question of putting, you know, seven modules in a box and hoping for the best. So, um, you know, it, it are, my, my thoughts are that in terms of multi-channel, clean, heady multi-channel power output, they are magnificent for the task, but they do require some, you know, expertise on the part of the manufacturers making use of them. So, you will see more of them, uh, but if you want a, a turnkey solution now, NAD is probably the pick of the pack. Yeah, I would have thought so. What's your thoughts on it, Kaz? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take <laughs> under advisement. Okay, you do that. Uh, we'll get there one week. You'll have an answer. <laughs> you, from you. Sure that would be an ecumenical matter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, so let's talk about our main subject tonight. Um, which is wireless. So, Ed, uh, you've been looking at a wireless active speaker system, and this is why this subject popped into your head and why we're going to talk about it this week. Yes. Um, I don't want to go over the course of this review because I've, uh, we've discussed this. I've written the review, and I'd very much like you to read it. If you have questions, pop them in the thread, and I'll, I'll try and deal with them. This is something that came up as a result of reviewing this product. Uh, the product in question, Piega Wireless 301, uh, it is an active speaker which you can communicate with wirelessly via a little plastic connect box that Piega actually bundles with the 301. So it comes inclusive of the £1,999 asking price. Um, it might be fair to say, and I don't want to spoil the review, I had some issues, not with how the box worked. The box worked beautifully. It connected first time. It connected instantly. It was utterly bulletproof in use. The thing is, it's not as convenient as you think it might be because it's an active speaker. You have to run a mains lead to it. Um, So uh, Piega, in their infinite wisdom, also have put a set of standard analog inputs on the back of both the speakers. And I stopped using the wireless box after a phase of finished testing that and switched over to just running a long RCA cable to it. And it didn't actually make it 
any less tidy, the cable just routed along the same path as the mains cable up the back of the stand, all very neat and tidy. And all of a sudden, the capabilities of the product expanded dramatically because the wireless bandwidth, whilst incredibly stable, it's limited to 2496. You can't, um, you can't I exceed that. Uh, and that's only with one set. So if you have more than one set in the house, you then have to go to backup wireless networks, which are a lower bandwidth and so on and so forth. And it sort of got me thinking, um, which is always a dangerous thing, I grant you, that um, we at the moment as an industry, this is a royal we, we are looking at, um, uh, at wireless as a sort of given with so many solution points. And it just, on occasions, when you actually sit back and look at it objectively, the result is not generally more convenient than actually just running a cable. Now, I know that I'm old and I know that I'm a traditionalist, so I'm aware that manufacturers sort of go with what the public perceives it needs because you have to, that, you know, it's a, it's a demand-based undertaking. But nevertheless, I'm just it, more than anything else interested to sort of get people's sort of ideals on this because there are times where it just strikes me that we fitted wireless to certain things and it doesn't actually make them better or more convenient because they still need power um, and if you've got more than one of them then you, you often have conflict issues and so on and so forth so um, Piega if you like uh, again be covered in more depth in, in the review sort of dug themselves out of a hole um, by fitting the, the, the wired connectivity to these speakers because honestly it brought out an entire extra level of performance in what they do. But um, I've got another wireless speaker system upstairs under test at the moment, um, which will be going onto the site uh, in, later on. And um, that's completely wireless. It has no wired option. Now, don't get me wrong, it performs extremely well and it does some very, very clever things. But again, you just sort of find yourself wondering, have I actually gained anything? Because I've still got mains leads flying in all directions to power the devices themselves. So yeah. I just wanted to open it up to the up to the floor as to how you I think, how uh, thought about it. I think there's a few different things. When you talk about wireless and wireless speakers, there's a few ideas that go around. Immediately, people think of Bluetooth speakers. That's not what we're talking about here. A Bluetooth wireless speaker is a speaker that will accept audio from Bluetooth um, and it's plugged into the wall or it runs on batteries. Um, that's one type of active wireless speaker, um, mainly for taking to the swimming pool <laughs> when you're allowed <laughs> to, and playing whatever off your phone and, and so on. That's one type of speaker. Uh, the other type of wireless speaker that, that we are talking about is high-end speakers, but they use either a module that's separate or they use a module that's that's built into either, either one of the speakers. One's a transmitter, one's a receiver. Um, you still got to plug them into the wall, um, but you will get the audio wireless um and it obviously it cuts down on on the cable and so that's kind of what we're talking about isn't it Ed? Mm, yeah um now i there is another type of uh approach to this and and um uh, and it's where I, i've come from in the past where i run active speakers so i run mackies back in the day i had five mm. mackie six speakers so i had to run mains but i also had to run uh audio cables to each speaker um, and it was quite a long run because you got to go all the way to the back of the room, you got to go to the front of the room as well. But obviously, having the amplification built into the speaker and matched to the drivers and so on, um, the audio quality is fantastic because the the amplification matches that of the driver and so on, and you're going to get the absolute best out of the speaker. So if you take away the cable, you still have to run the power cable, but if you take away the cable and do that wirelessly, as long as you've got the bandwidth there, that still interests me because, mm. uh, you know, again, you've got the amplification built in, which is why you need to run the power. You've got to power the amplifier that's that's in the speaker. Um, but if you can do that, you can do the crossover within the speaker as well, digitally or whatever. It's, it's a nice solution. I quite like the idea of the solution. But I think where when you talk about wireless, people automatically think that there's no wires whatsoever run into mm. the unit, and that's not the case. Where I've had issues with wireless speakers is with uh, the latest sound bars. So I've got the still in the box. It's getting collected the next week when the, the LG TV uh, gets delivered. But I've had an LG sound bar set up for 
I had it over Christmas and New Year, actually, used it over Christmas and New Year, made a video on it um, and then used it. And fantastic that you can get a full uh, 714 Atmos system from a soundbar and two rear speakers. The rear speakers are wireless, but you got to run yeah, power cables to them. And of course, uh, because you don't have any control over each speaker at the rear in terms of volume, they have to be equidistant to where you sit so you get the, the correct mix of sound. And that was a problem because the leads that they provided with the rear speakers were about 1.5 metres, maybe two metre long uh, power cables. Mm. And of course, the clover leaf um, yeah. connectors. <laughs> so uh, what I had to do was I had to have two extension cables to get them the proper distance away and behind me and so on. It kind of defeated the purpose of yeah. them being wireless speakers because I had to find other solutions to run the power. And the thing is, if it's a speaker, you have to run a speaker with power. Um, you know, it's if it's wireless, it has to have an amp application built into it. It has to get amplification some way. Um, and that's always going to be the issue, I think, with, with wireless speakers. Is it a good idea? Yes, I like the idea. I like the idea that some manufacturers are also bringing in devices that you can plug into your AVR um, uh, as a as a transmitter, and then you, you've got the receiver that you can plug into your subwoofer. Well, it must be said, yeah, RHEL's Arrow system, uh, yep. which Steve has tested for the forums I've tested elsewhere, that's brilliant because it's sort of a given. People accept it accept quite readily that their subwoofer is going to need power but it does it gives you absolute freedom of positioning which as we've discussed many times with, with subwoofers is absolutely critical um so that's a, a fine example of it of it working beautifully with a stereo pair of powered speakers like these piegas um maybe i i i guess one of the other factors that i suppose i need to factor into this is that um power for these speakers comes from the same central point in my rack that the actual signal does so i suppose if you had plugs closer to the speakers it might be a different different case of things but there's always going to be cables running out from the rack to power the damn thing um so you sort of may as well have have the um have the cable as well and it's very interesting what you say about the length of mains leads the uh, speaker system upstairs thankfully that's just a figure eight mains lead so you could go on amazon and pick yourself a, a set of length leads of any length that you basically fancied but the length that the manufacturer has supplied is pre is sort of pre-assumes that the power supply for the the products will be centralized to them where okay it is in this instance but it won't be for everybody so yeah. if it's offset to one side one speaker has got more than enough string and the other one really really doesn't so it's it's just as i say i i just find myself thinking that there are occasions where it's sort of being done because it seems like the right thing to be doing um in the in the specific case of the piega it's as much because there are limitations with the uh there are limitations in what the actual wireless control box can do it doesn't have a remote control for example so it effectively needs a separate preamp to be useful and if you've got a separate preamp you may as well then just run wired to the loudspeakers yeah. but nevertheless um i just find myself i just think we're at an in, a point where we risk in the pursuit of trying to appeal, con appear convenient to people, we actually may end up antagonising them because the reality of what they actually get when they unbox it is not what they thought it was going to be. And you'd be bet you'd have been better off being upfront about the benefits of putting it together with actual physical string. Yeah, in the case of the soundbar that I was using, I think one of the things um, that would be most useful. Um, not so much the power cable, because I had to have them equidistant to where I was sitting because you can't adjust the volume of either speaker. So they have to sit at a certain point so you get the sound arriving at the same time um, and at the same volume. If we could adjust that within the menu system, which you can't do at the minute, that would solve one of the problems with, with these rear speakers. And then it's just a case of you just have to find a power a way to run the power socket. Uh, to the speaker and then you can place the speakers in different places because they are assuming that your TV is bang in the centre of the room you can, you can have the speakers at either uh, end either side of you 
people don't have living room setups like that. People have TVs in a corner. If you're talking about the general consumer, it's only people like us that try and have the TV smack bang in the middle mm. of the yeah you know, the main wall and, and all the rest of it. So having the uh, the flexibility, I think, would solve some of the issues. And we said it a few times: people are downsizing and they're going for a more minimalist approach. And I guess this is where the appeal for wireless comes in because you automatically think, well, there's no wires that are hanging around until you realize you need the you need wires for your uh, for the rear. Now, one solution Ed could be, um, and I think one manufacturer has tried it, maybe a couple of manufacturers, is that you have a black box um at the rear of the room, which then sends the signal to the speakers. Yeah. Um I, that's been I, I've seen that once or twice. I mean, believe it or not, I mean, I remember an incredible technology demonstration of um, ISE many years ago, where, um, so we are talking a while ago, where, uh, you know, the same principles that are used for wireless charging? Hmm. Well, essentially, uh, someone had built what looked like an ordinary, um, you know, side cabinet. And if you just stuck a monitor down on it, it powered up. It had enough power to run devices up to and including like uh, PC monitors and so on and so forth. Simply by sticking it down the desk, it just then wires it. So if you went, if you had something, <clears throat> again, going back to the more Bluetooth speakery end of things, but, you know, wireless, the sort of wireless loudspeakers that Steve and I test armies of over the course of a year, those would have the scope that you could plonk those down on a surface and they'd just power up. I mean, I don't want to know what the energy wastage is on, <laughs> in terms of over just powering them off the wall. Yeah. But nevertheless, something like that is an interesting way around these well, sort the, of issues the, there as is, well. There are solutions like that, Ed. So one of the uh, speaker bars from Philips, you plug the surrounds into the main speaker bar, they charged up, they were battery powered. Yeah. And then when you watched the film, you placed them behind you because they were wireless and battery powered. There was no cables You whatsoever. just stuck them down and away they went. You just stuck them down behind you. But again, you did. I don't think you had the flexibility to, to adjust the volume of each speaker. But again, that's a, that's a solution there that actually does work because it yeah. is wireless, you know. So, um, Greg, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think what you've been saying, people think of a wireless speaker system, get it home, unpack it, and realise they've got a they've got cables coming from it. It doesn't. Uh, it hasn't quite got got there to everyone i don't think you know you think of wireless you think of what no wires you've got to plug a you know not most houses don't have a socket you know where all you'd want your speakers to go yeah so you got the problem if uh, you've still got wires to it so what's the point you might as well just have a wired system yeah i mean it's, it's, it's true what you say there greg i mean this house was built in 1975 um and when it was originally built it had two main sockets two single main sockets one in one corner one opposite um so they uh and and yeah it, it, i mean thankfully uh, one of the previous owners has then slapped in loads more so i'm laughing but it's it when when you're when you're confronted with older properties like that what you say there it's like or it's like i want to use it in this corner but actually there's nowhere near which mm. actually allows you to get anywhere near it yeah our, our house is about the same age and that's the same in in some in the lounge, there's only like two sockets. Yeah, my my house is a good two hundred and fifty year old, and I, I'd hate to think what the wiring actually is. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, um, but again, looking at solutions here, battery technology, Greg is getting better and better each mm. year. Uh, being obviously being driven by the fact that you know we have to be more energy efficient as as we go on, and mobile phones are developing all the time electric cars coming on so battery development is certainly there that that could be a solution couldn't it you could yeah, have battery yep. powered speakers yep. yeah yeah i think when, when it's completely wire free i think <clears> that will that's when it might take off alternatively a more man style solution would be to have an enormous tesla coil <laughs> and then simply zap massive quantities of, uh, uh, of of ac in sort of lightning bolts over your head it's definitely a more macho solution yeah. um uh, you know definitely get some comments running that i, I know it's ken uh, son of the sg uh, made a, a comment in the area he, he had to go the girth route didn't he, mm -hmm. he said, you know what well, if you're running uh, power cables are usually of a thicker girth than, than speaker cables are so it's easier to hide speaker cables at the end of the day than it is 
power cables. And and you're right, you know, uh, in most circumstances that is that is the case. Sometimes it's easier to hide speaker cable, and speaker cable can be designed to be hidden. Uh, all sorts of flat cables and and so on. Uh, uh, lots of solutions there. So yeah. It's an interesting subject. There's one that I'm, I guess we're going to be coming back to. Uh, As we come, well, I'll be covering uh, wireless speaker systems in their varying flavors is one of the uh, key categories that I'm looking at in 2021. So we're going to be looking yeah. at many different iterations of it. Um, as I say, this opening effort from Piega will be going up on the, the, the site at some point. Um, uh, and then there's uh, uh, one from a rather more well-known brand. It's as I say, it's under, under test at the moment. I'm writing it tomorrow. Um, and uh, that's a very wireless solution. Um, and it has impressed me what it can do, no no mistake. But, um, you know, it, it's also revealed some some issues or some issues is the wrong word. It's revealed some of the limitations inherent to the system that they've chosen. Yeah. Right, before we move on, uh, if you uh, do enjoy these podcasts and you do like them, and if you're watching on YouTube, then please do hit the like button. It does help us out. Uh, it helps us out because it puts the uh, podcast and the video in front of new people, people that don't necessarily follow wave forums and so on, and it helps us bring new people into the community. And there's, there's nothing better than bringing new, new people, new blood into our cult. So if you could help us do that by clicking the like button, um, that would be appreciated if you're watching us on YouTube. If you listen to the audio version later in the week or you're watching the, the YouTube video later in the week, then again, a like or leave us a rating on your podcast provider. It does help out. So thank you very much for that. And thanks again for all your generous donations this evening. Right, moving on. Just very, very quickly, that um, I, I, I won't uh, take... Nigel, just stick a VM95 on it the reviews on the uh, again, site just do that uh, again it helps other people if they know what you're talking about Ed. uh well yes it, it was uh it, it, there's no context this because it's largely been a communication over facebook but uh nigel henry long-standing listener uh periodic partner at the bristol show so on and so forth uh mainly drinking uh he has been bought a rega planer 2 by his good wife and rega io and he's just asked what do you change on that first to improve the performance talked about mains cables leave the mains cables alone Nigel they're a safety feature they're not a performance feature uh, if you want to improve the, the performance of that just change the cartridge uh, Riga fits a cartridge which is branded Riga on the play, planer 2 but it's an Audio Technica so you can stick an Audio Technica VM95 on you need to change no other setting on it uh, away it goes and the performance gets better jobs are good one. yep okay good stuff Right, uh, very, very quickly, I'm going to talk about the RCAM AV40 and the PA720 amplifier. I've finished uh, reviewing them now. I've actually used them well over Christmas. I wasn't expecting them to turn up uh, just before Christmas. Uh, funnily enough, they did. Um, so I've been using them for a little while now. I've spoken about them in previous podcasts. Uh, but just to give you final thoughts before the review goes up, um, I said when I first started talking about them that it was very buggy. I found now that it's, now it's been updated a couple of times and I've been running this uh, a little while. I've gotten used to the uh, the quirks, let's call them quirks, uh, of the unit. Um, the remote control was was uh, ridiculous for a long time. It wouldn't work. Um, you'd pick it up one day and it'd work fine for the whole day. you pick it up the next day and it just wouldn't work. You'd have to hard reset the, uh, the AVR, uh, sorry, the AV processor power it out, power it back on um, before it would accept any commands and so on. Um, that's now not an issue. Um, it's kind of resolved itself. It hasn't done it uh, for quite a number of weeks now. And I use I use it every single day. I use it for background music if I'm not watching movies. Um, so I've had no issues with that. I run um, uh, Chromecast, uh, Spotify to the unit every day for background music. Again, it was a little bit hit and miss to begin with, a little bit patchy. Uh, I was getting dropouts uh, when I shouldn't be getting dropouts and so on. What I found was that when I um, I went and used the web interface, um, so that's obviously you, you go to your browser, type in the IP address of of the ARCAM, and it'll load up a, a menu system for you on a web page. Once I'd done that, it kind of solved quite a few of the issues that I was having. So even just logging into the web browser and using that, um, to change a couple of settings and then closing it down again, it seemed to fix issues that had been issues like dropouts and so on. It's weird. And I can only put it down to the fact that I've opened up the web page because since I've done that, 
it hasn't had any issues with uh, the vast majority of uh, sources that have been sending it, uh, whether I've been using Chromecast or whatever. Or um, It's just worked, and it's worked every time now. So from a unit that was frustrating for a long time, um, it's starting to sort itself out, and I don't have issues with it. I don't, I'm not swearing at it as much as I, I was when I first set it up. Um, and in terms of performance, it's a, it, it's a definite close to a 10 out of 10 performance. It, it's a fantastic sounding uh, AV processor, especially with two channel. Um, and I know you've, you've looked at the, the two channel units, Ed, uh, but yeah. with two channel, Arkham really have it nailed. I mean, they are a hi-fi brand at the end of the day. If, any, if they can't do two channel, then you know, nobody can, but it really is a, it's a real performer. Um, Denarc Live, it's a it's a slightly different implementation. It's their implementation of it. Um, there's a few things that you need to be aware of. Uh, you need to make sure that the mic that you're using has a profile uh, or you download the profile for it before you run uh, Denarc. But once you've run it, it needs tinkering. It's not the same as the impl implementation on the NAD 778 that I had before the, the Arcam came in. That just worked. It just, you know, it did what I expected it to do, and, and, and it just worked you know, properly. Whereas the, the RCAM took a bit of fettling. It took a bit of going back and adjusting the filter um, and uh, and just playing around with it and, and understanding, you know, making mistakes. Bill, was That's, that loading to – I mean, to, with the SA30 that I did, the RCAM had a target curve. So they had um, – as well as being able to notionally request a flat response – there is a Harman. There was a Harman yeah, I, luxury audio. Target yeah, I, I don't. I did download that as well, and I tried that. And again, <clears> it wasn't to wasn't to my liking. Uh, it was mm, it was doing yeah. too much. To the M, M and Ks are, are, are they've got a nice mid range and a really nice top end in it. it, it when you flatten that out in this room that I use, it just takes all the soul out of the out of the speaker, and um, it, it was adjusting the volume and it was taking it too low and so on. So. I did do a lot of experimentation. I made a lot of mistakes because you only learn from making mistakes. Mm -hmm. So you only you only find out how things work by by you know pushing it a little bit and then realizing what it's doing. And then so once I, I'd gotten the hang of it and played around with it and found the filters that I like and that suit my room, um, fantastic. I I love the thing. I think it's it's great. It's worth the money. Um, you know, yes, it has been buggy to start with. Um, it hasn't done it any favors whatsoever because if you read the owners' forums, um, owners said, it is, um, and rightly so. I mean, you know, you shouldn't be beta testing on 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 your customers because that's how you lose customers if you yeah. start, start doing things like that. You really should be doing groundwork before you release uh, these products. But sorry, I got distracted because Greg's cuts there <laughs> moving around in the background. Um, <laughs> oh, look. But, but yes. Uh, it, it has improved immensely and, and once it's working and once once it's doing what it could do, it's a nine and a half, ten out of ten product in terms of sound quality, in terms of um, multi-channel and all the rest of it. It really is uh, it really is a, a cracking processor. And the amplifier, the class G, seven channels of class G, you can't go wrong. It's fantastic. It doesn't get very hot. Um, you can actually run the processor on top of the amplifier and not worry about frying it. Because there's not that much heat coming out of the out of the uh, out of the uh, Arcam, um, and it just sounds great. You've got a really nice neutral neutral balance sound to it, which uh, worked surprisingly well with the MK speakers that I use. The MP300s uh, can really drive them quite hard um, without distortion, without getting sibilant in any way. It's uh, yeah, really nice. So look out for the review. The review will be coming probably in the next uh, week or two because I've got some videos and other podcasts that i need to work on first of all but uh, keep your eyes out the review will be coming up soon and for our last uh little bit of hardware before we move on to software uh greg you've been looking at some earphones now my understanding is you got these earphones quite a while back and uh the, the there's been some changes uh to these items is that yeah right? yeah that's it yeah. yeah, it's the uh, Lipotec, um earphones. I reviewed the Tevi on the forums or well, probably a year ago um, before the world ended. Um, they were uh, 100 quid and really good performers. I'm not sure many people have heard of Lipotec, um, but I've, they sent me their next earphones, which are about £30 cheaper. Um, they were supposed to be called the Levy, 
um, but I think there were some um, issues with the with the name on that. Um, so they're now called the Sound Free S20. Um, retail for seventy pounds. Um, got Bluetooth five, up to forty hours battery life, um, and they come in a nice little uh, sort of pill shaped case like this, um, which adds the to the battery life. And they're a yeah, really good set. And the review should go up on the forum soon. Um, really good sound quality. Not quite as good as the um, the Tevi, um, but for the money, they uh, sound really good. I have to ask because I I'm fast. I, I haven't yet reviewed any wireless buds. Have you? I mean, in terms of them staying in, I mean, do they? Gen, I mean, obviously, we don't get to do hyperactivity stuff at the moment, <laughs> even if we don't. But I mean, do they? Do you wander out and about absolutely confident that they are going to be? staying in place and they're not going anywhere and so on and so forth and yeah well the later ones tend like this set they tend to come with a lot of different size tips um yeah. in fact this set have got six th three um of one type of material and three of another um and one of them has got a double edge on it so you can it's not the case of just trying to shove it in your ear as hard as you can so it doesn't come out these have got quite a good um seal on them so yeah they don't they don't feel like they're going to um pop out not that I've been able to do any well, exercise, that's, that's, but that's like, yeah. positive. <laughs> but um, and and presumably, and they don't, and 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 all charging takes place through the case. So I mean, they yes. they go back into the case, mm. and that can be you know plugged in and charged, and then the case has got an additional battery in it to give you a boost on the move. That's it. Yeah, the the ear, earbuds themselves probably got. I think it's about they say about eight hours, but it's lasting a bit longer on the test. Um, and then you can put them back in the case, and you you know you've got up to forty before you even need to charge them again. Oh, um, and, and, and on these ones, which the Tevi didn't have, the uh, case is wireless charging as well. Mm. So, which is... Uh, you see, the irony is, is I, my car is the only thing I have with a wireless charger, but uh, my phone is an Oppo, who are some, in some way related to OnePlus, and they've gone down the other path of having incredibly high voltage um usb chargers they don't fit wireless charging because they, they they prefer you to use their um 30 watt usb chargers so it would be the only opportunity i'd have to use my wireless charging panel mm. which is uh <laughs> it is uh, i mean i have to say i uh, the the plan is again I, I i intend to look at a few a few other pairs of the wireless earphones um at, at some some other price points as well um but uh, as yet, no, it's not not come to pass. So mm. uh, I'm glad that you're getting through some of them, Greg. So yeah, can, no, they are getting have better. Present, okay. oh, well, yes, this this appears to be a thing. It's interesting that, as you say, these are £30 cheaper than the last set. And it would appear that actually the quality of difference is not necessarily as much as you might have expected the yeah, first time around when you did it. Yeah, the quality isn't as good as the Tevi, but it's not, it's not that much worse. Um, and I've reviewed a lot of earphones around that sort of between sort of 30 pound and upwards price. Um, and, and these, you know, for the price, the quality is really good. Mm. Um, and I could just seen someone asked to put a message on sound free for a, a set of earphones is maybe not. <laughs> it's, a, it's a name. It has, <laughs> it has connotation issues, but they've decided to run with it. So we just, we yeah. just we're going to humor them, you know, it's fine. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> but yes, I take your point. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Uh, any idea when that review will be ready? Uh, it should be in the next few days. Next few days. Excellent. Mm. So look out yep. on the homepage for that mm. if you're interested uh, in those. So that's hardware done with. Um, we just need to quickly look through and see if there's uh, there has been any hardware questions before we move on. Um, because we've still got a few. Yeah, we're actually ahead of time. I'm, I'm well impressed. It looks... Um, uh... It, it, it does very much. I, I don't. I have a just. Just as an aside, I have a Zoom background predominantly to prevent the fact that there are generally always cats in shot. If I don't have the Zoom background, mm -hmm. but it would appear from the reception that Greg's cat got that mm. I probably ought to stop fighting this and just <laughs> just <laughs> accept the fact that I am perennially surrounded by cats. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's only one question I could find that hasn't been answered, and that was from uh, Gustavo. He says, "Phil will then release." A new receiver this year with more than one HDMI 1.2.1 uh, port. Um, how do you answer this? And uh, not at the moment is is probably the safest answer for that one because I don't really know what they're doing with the uh, 
with the flagship 8500 whether it goes back is, to what we were saying earlier about increasing the length of time that yeah that one's that one's for. been around a while now i mean i've got an 8500 here i've had it for for a little while now on uh, on long term test um there was going to be a 2.1 uh, board to be added to yeah. that which uh, was going to happen and i was going to test it out but that has been delayed obviously with covid and everything else so um to be honest with you i don't know at this moment in time um, we did have Denon on the podcast a little while ago, and uh, um, there was nothing mentioned back then. So uh, I guess the, the best thing would be to kind of hang hang around till about the IFA time, so August September, yeah, uh, and see if anything's announced then. Because the eighty five hundred would be due for a for a refresh because um, it has been around for a couple of years now, maybe even coming up three years because they launched the anniversary special last year, didn't they? They, they did, yes. So, uh, so yeah, it might, might be coming up for a refresh. Let's, uh, we'll wait and see, see what happens with that one. Uh, right. So I think we've, uh, we've caught up with all the questions. Uh, keep them coming if you are watching live. Um, if you're not watching live and you do want to ask us questions, you can also do that uh, using podcast at AB Forum. So remember that one. Right. Uh, before we go any further, software time coming up next. If you enjoy the podcast on YouTube, then please like and subscribe. If you're listening to the audio version, then please leave us a rating on your podcast app. We invite you to email questions and feedback to podcast at avforums.com and join in with this episode's discussion thread in the podcasts forum at AV Forums. So we're going to start uh, software with our usual album of the week. It's been pretty, pretty poor for the, the start of this year, Ed, but... This week, we finally got something decent to listen to. We do. Actually, this week, things took a, an upswing, full stop. Um, so it was good. But uh, this wins out. Um, uh, and uh, it would appear that there was some consensus amongst other podcast um, uh, participants that this isn't a bad shout on my part. Because uh, it's a film name. John Carpenter. He of many wonderful films. It's a well-known fact that John Carpenter, as well as directing many of his early films, scored them as well. Um, and he sort of got out of the habit of doing it as the budgets increased. But um, some years ago, he started to um, uh, get back into producing. It wasn't music for specific films, but it was music produced in the same spirit as had been done for the original film. So there's been Lost Themes and Lost Themes 2. This is the imaginatively named Lost Themes 3. It came out on Friday. Uh, it's on all of the streaming services. You can buy it on physical media. Um, if, like me, some of, I mean, some of the scores that John, uh, that John Carpenter put together are magnificent. Um, my background, uh, the Pork Chop Express from Big Trouble in Little China. One, I think that's a great score, full stop. But the actual Pork Chop Express main theme, that's that's music to drive recklessly fast to. Um, and this is, if you're looking for someone to be at the cutting edge of what can be done with electronic music, please give a man who is into his 70s a break on this one. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it takes all of the stuff he was doing in the 70s and it gently and invigoratingly updates what he's been doing. Um, and I just think it's a it's a really entertaining listen. It's 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 music for a film that hasn't been created yet. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Phil, I think you did, too. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Tom, uh, who isn't with us this evening, was also eulogising it. I don't, I don't know uh, if Kaz has uh, had a listen uh, or oh, Greg. I but... haven't. I haven't had the chance to give it a shot, but it has uh, it has driven me in the general direction of all of his lost themes. So I've yeah, had, I mean the, the his lost own... themes going in the background for the last couple of days. I think the first album is what I'm the, listening to. The first is but the the opening track of the first album is just mag in terms of. The creation of atmosphere is just magnificent. Um, if you don't want to listen to the electronic musings of an old man, um, <laughs> there is um, another album out by a Dutch group called De Wolf, uh, D-E, Wolf with two Fs, uh, called The Wolf Pack, which they've done during lockdown. Um, and it's a big, happy, 
crunchy rock number so if you're not up for electronica have a listen to that instead uh, and um the weekend who i'm sure that phil enjoyed during his super bowl show um he's put his greatest hits out as well and um that's music to take lots of powder self-esteem to and drive too quickly <laughs> so yes <laughs> yeah I, I went to bed at half time i knew which way it was going but it's but by half time well you know i'm not going to judge you yeah. um but I thought, yeah. it'd be, I thought it'd be a far closer game than it was but it, i was expecting to be a real close game and it wasn't you could tell which way it was going and you could tell the old man was he was, still he was, still had one in him he, he knew he was going to get his seventh super bowl and he did so well done tom brady right uh john carbon the lost themes three is uh, the recommendation this week has anybody been listening to anything else i want to mention at this point greg uh no not really uh well i'm still listening to Hans Zimmer. I love his uh, scores. When you're talking about John Carpenter, Hans Zimmer is another one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can't Especially when he actually does a score and not just him sitting on the keyboard, which was the Inception yeah. score. <laughs> um, sorry, Kev. Yeah. Uh, I mean, his, his Rush score, which he did pretty much concurrently with uh, Inception, is one of the finest things he's ever done. It's mm. absolutely sensational. So, yes, complete agreement on that. Yeah. And uh, BBC Four on iPlayer, uh, it's still there. You can go watch it. It's a, a documentary about film scores. Um, and it talks to all the film composers about, you know, how they get their ideas and how they work to deadlines. And it's fascinating that, you know, the, the length of time they actually have to come up with the score once the film has yeah. been more or less put together. Um, they don't have much time to... to you know get it all together so it's really interesting can i do a quick yeah. anecdote uh, son of sj has just said i like john carpenter's score to assault on precinct 13 from 1976 i do too however uh because i am young i know, I know where you're going with this 1976 as far as i'm concerned the main oh, theme yes. from assault on uh on precinct 13 uh was was hijacked by bomb the base yeah. uh, and became used in the amiga uh, shoot yeah. 'em up Xenon 2 Mega Blast. It was actually so, um, it was actually Brothers. sampled quite a bit in the early days of hip hop uh, yeah. assault on precinct thirteen. So, so when I watched was one of them. when I watched Assault on Precinct Thirteen for the first time, I was like, Christ, it's the Xenon music. <laughs> 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 a bit of a, a bit of a, a, a of a um, of a reversion to the actual historical fact of these things. But no, um, <laughs> what his, one of John Carpenter's very earliest efforts, and he never set out to do the score for that. It was just simply that it needed a score. He had a budget of eleven p, and he went out and did his own, and it's iconic. All all of John Carpenter's scores sound like they were done on a Commodore sixty four. He's, he's oh, I don't know, they, they've been it's, not, it's not really eight bit though, is it? It's more. It's very, very eighty synth. Yes, it's heavy but, synth. Yeah. It just sounds like John Carpenter is sitting in front of a synth and pressing buttons. Yeah. Uh, while, but he does it with a, cer a, a certain it, it panache. Is, no, don't get me wrong. I think they I think they're works of borderline genius, but it's just crazy to think. I think it's a mood, isn't it? There's mad hair just pressing buttons. I thought it was a TV three hundred three, not a mood. Was it? All right, yeah. it could be very, but, very similar. But yeah, yeah. exactly where you're coming from. Uh, some of the, uh, in the chat window, some people uh, recommending stuff. So uh, Fueled Funny saying Spotify has thrown out some good stuff for him recently. Uh, Henry Jackman, uh, Marco Beltrami. So yes. not aware of them, but Edward. Ramin Jurati is the bloke who did the Game of Thrones soundtrack. Uh, ah, did the, right. And also did um, his his finest outing, uh, a score indisputably better than the film it partners, his Pacific Rim score for the original. That is, again, music to fight wars to. Okay. Uh, I sort of agree. Hans Zimmer's Blade Runner 2049 score is, I think that's an example of a film score which is extraordinarily potent in the context of the film itself. I don't necessarily enjoy sitting down and listening to it on its own no but it's it it is interesting how it, it calls back to the original yes but without sounding like the original if you know what i mm. mean it, it's like it's like like the film it's moved on within the same universe and it's done particularly well uh without you know calling back too much on on the original score so yeah i yeah, agree with Jack, you. henry jackman uh, is the guy who did the score to winter soldier which I think is one of the best scores in the and whole Marvel X -Men, universe. X Men First Class. As he did. Well. He did do First Class. I just think that uh, in Winter Soldier, I mean, it makes all the difference having that kind of score. He also did on, um, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer, um, which is sure. an well, example. All done no, trap, no, no. Can we hear me out on this? The film is absolute bobbins. The score 
is magnificent. That is, if you just sit down and listen to it as a piece of modern classical music and expunge any thoughts of Abraham Lincoln from your head, it's a really beautiful piece of work. Genuinely excellent. Yes, Vampire Hunter, thank you. Your, your pedantry check is in the post license. Thanks. <laughs> Right, let's move on to talking about some films, actually. Uh, film review time, Kaz. Sure. Um, well, I, I had to sit through some a pretty bad film from Bruce Willis last week, which was anti-life. You, you didn't have to. Okay. okay. <laughs> I, I elected to, to save the rest of the human race. Um, that's that's and, better. Yeah. And I, I this, thought Tom, Tom had all the bad stuff. No, no can't get the prizes at, 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 at Drivel. Yeah, to be fair, I mean, I, Tom, Tom gets to pick most of the stuff he does. And if he wants to pick something bad, he it's generally because he wants to have a big rant about it. Can it's, I just say that of, of all of us that produce content for AV forums, nobody puts the boot in like Tom does. No, he does very mm-hmm. well. Um, well I mean, I've half a mind to ask him to do a hardware review just for the sheer unbridled joy of it. Yeah, but you don't review anything bad, Ed. Well, no, I get to no, I get to select good stuff. But I mean, if he he adopted the same Netflix policy that he does for hardware, who knows where that could go? <laughs> yeah, I, I do like it when he uh, describes a far better film in the review, and then <laughs> it's just. But that's uh, anyway. Um, so my next challenge was Nicolas Cage's last film, latest film. And after Willis, I thought, you know, how bad can it get? Uh, it's called um, it's called Willy's Wonderland. I mean, <laughs> we're, not, we're not doing well here. I mean, they changed it to Wally's Wonderland in America, changed the posters, changed the dialogue. I'm not really sure why they did Willy's Wonderland. And then at the last minute thought, well, let's not do this. Let's change it all. But anyway, it's Willy's Wonderland. And it's really good. I really enjoyed it. It's mad. It's it's proper. <laughs> It's one of those crazy cage gems that you just don't see coming. Um, he always seems to put 300% into the most <laughs> atrocious movies. And in this case, it kind of works. He doesn't say a single word the entire movie. Um, he's the usual kind of crazy Nicolas Cage, effortlessly cool, uh, prepared to go toe-to-toe and get really aggressive when he needs to um and it's a it's insanely simple plot that which works which is basically that he gets lured into a dilapidated fun house full of animatronics which are possessed and has to uh, has to survive overnight by fighting them and um yeah, it's 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 like a video game come to life, and only only Nicolas Cage could do a movie like this and make it work. Um, and it did make me think, you know, when was the last time I, I saw like Bruce Willis put effort into a trashy movie? You know, he I get I get that the, Willis, Willis has not worked for years. He's been phoning it in for. Well, it's um, just it's just a Nicolas Cage phone. It, it does, never phones in a performance. No, he even never. In, phone- Really it's bad. The op- it's the opposite problem where occasionally, <laughs> occasionally just reining it in ever so slightly. Yeah, you know. yeah I mean, you have to wonder I mean, what drugs he's on. It was he. Yeah, yeah I, re- I really enjoyed it, and I'm I'm really looking forward to what he's he's got cooking next. He's got. Cass, did you see that blog post off. which had a conspiracy theory that he just has an out of office set up that just agrees to every music <laughs> movie script <laughs> that, he, <laughs> that he's given? Well, I mean, if if you get the, this, I mean, if you look at the poster. You look at listen to the name. I mean, you you just wouldn't you wouldn't think you, it would work. But uh, yeah, Nicholas Cage he makes it work. Um, I also checked out Denzel Washington's latest. Uh, now Washington famously uh, has been on record as saying he regrets turning down the opportunity to play the Black Brad Pitt character in Seven. I think it was going to be Pacino mm. as the um, Morgan Freeman character and. And Denzel Washington as a Brad Pitt character, and uh, and this is very seven. It's um, it's debuting on HBO Max. There's rumours that it's going to come out this Friday on digital with zero fanfare in the UK. Um, no one can confirm it, but that's when the theatrical date was, and no one's moved that date. And, Sorry, Cass, very quickly, how do we watch something. Wally's Wonderland? Because I'm semi tempted. Uh, uh, <laughs> Wally's Wonderland. Sorry, Wally's yeah, Wonderland right. is on digital Friday. Cool. Um, 
so so yeah you can pick it up on digital and i recommend you have to pay for it though you do well, have to pay I, for I it i don't know you kaz has almost tempted me to spend money on this it's <laughs> oh, it's wow. it's proper crazy <laughs> It is. It is proper crazy. But that said, no one's going to watch it and it'll be on Sky in under two months for free. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm not putting you off, Ed, spending your fiver on Willy's Wonderland, <laughs> which will be your only movie purchase of the year. <laughs> but uh, I'm just saying. No, no actually, can we, can we, I think I stuck it on Twitter. I had a point earlier in lockdown where I, I purchased um, Dodgeball on Amazon because <laughs> I just, <laughs> strangest desire to watch dodgeball so uh, i have bought a film this year well, <laughs> make of that what you will <laughs> but uh denzel washington's latest is uh is a bit seven um it's by uh john lee hancock who did highwayman for netflix with kevin costner and um and it's got washington and remy malik from mr robot teaming up to take on a serial killer who they're finding hard to catch um, their prime suspect is uh, is uh, I don't know I don't really I don't I don't want to um, tell too much about it but I suppose the fact that he's up for for plenty of awards is is Jared Leto um, famously bad as the Joker and he's he's up for an uh, an Oscar I think in the role um, it's an odd little film I think it's worth watching but it is definitely cast under the shadow of Seven uh it feels through and through like the same story told with a few twe tweaks to to make it fresh um the only thing it's got really going for it is denzel washington who in thinking about it he can literally make anything watchable i'd, I'd watch any of his films again probably more than than people who've got far more oscars than he has and um I think he's he's tremendous at bringing gravitas and charisma to any role and that deep kind of soulful look in his eyes like he's carried the weight <laughs> of the world on his shoulders. Remy Malik, um, I'm not sure I rate him. Uh, I, I love oh. Mr. Robot and I have not seen his Freddie Mercury, but uh, I have to say I'm not sure that these are the roles that are quite suited to him. It's uh, it's Freddie Mercury was fantastic. Well, he won an Oscar for it, so that tells you everything you need to know really about that. But uh, he's he's the bad guy as well in the in the, that James Bond film we all missed. That's never happening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, that uh, we'll all know who. Which no, no time to see. Like <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm not. I'm just not sure in his acting style and when he's when he's cast and things whether it works. I mean, clearly it worked for Freddie Mercury. Um, but I, I I haven't seen that yet, and everything I see him in, I just think that it doesn't it doesn't quite suit him. Is he supposed to be the young brash kind of Brad Pitt character, and it, it doesn't really work for him? Um, but it is um, a how good... much of how much of Mr. Robot have you watched, Kaz? Uh, three and a half seasons. But do you think you've you've maybe got a picture of him typecast? Uh, sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they're, they're, so, they're, so is everybody else who's probably. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that's that's, <laughs> that's maybe right, but... that's maybe the issue that you have. You maybe associate him so much with that character that anything else is feels a little bit odd. That's where I was going with that one. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I I, I don't. He, he doesn't in this, and I've seen him in one other thing, and I can't remember what it is, but um, he doesn't in this look like he's trying to lean in any other direction and so it's hard to escape the feeling that he's been slightly miscast it did, it, i mean it didn't it just didn't didn't work for me uh, he does grow on you though it's just he wasn't um he wasn't a defining moment in it uh jared Leto, on the other hand absolutely nails it and <laughs> fantastically terrifying performance uh the the trouble with the movie apart from sitting in the shadow of seven is that they can't stick the ending i think it really undoes it it's really a movie that you'll get to the last half an hour on and you'll go this could either go and be really so watch, memorable so watch or... real one and two and yeah, and yeah they, they just can't stick the ending and and it's a shame it um it falls from being a, a, a nice little memorable thriller with Denzel Washington to being a, a film that you'd otherwise find on Netflix with Denzel Washington. 
And again, you'd watch it for him, but yeah, I mean, there's there's one film where I did not like him. Uh, I did not. I didn't like him. I didn't like the character. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't deal with the character, and that was uh, uh, the one we played the pilot. Was it Flight? Is that the name of the film? That was oh, a very funny. odd film. I loved well, I thought him he was. In Flight. I thought he was he got... good. He was good in it, but no, you're right. The character was morally ambiguous. Yeah, yeah, yeah which was great. So. He was it, I, so for me that was much better than Sully. He he got the Oscar nomination for that, and I think uh, I think it's only kind of the Trump uh, the the award style that it went to Daniel Day Lewis for Abraham Lincoln, you know Daniel Day Lewis in a Spielberg film versus Denzel Washington in Flight. But um, but I thought he he really brought a lot to a character that that if it was anyone else playing that role, it would be just an average movie. I have to say, I absolutely, I love him in Unstoppable, but I love Unstoppable full stop. I mean, that film has everything that I'm looking for in a film. It's incredibly loud. It's got, you know, explosions. It's got proper, not CGI explosions of stuff as well. And uh, in, in the middle of it is Denzel Washington being majestic. So, you know, <laughs> what, what more can you ask for? Okay, so there's a couple of films to look out for anyway. Willie's Wonderland. Uh <laughs> Go check that out. And, uh, the I'll let you know things. next week if I relent and go for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need to move on to film and TV news and obviously some sad news uh, that Mr. Christopher Plummer moved on uh, this last week. Um, I, I, again, another big, big actor, big Hollywood name. Um, most famous, I think, for obviously for The Sound of Music. Um, or certainly that was the role that he was most well uh, regarded for but uh, again Kaz another another big heavyweight uh, when it comes to acting yeah I think it's a I think it's a real shame I mean I I can't think of a single role he's played where he hasn't made it <laughs> he hasn't really chewed it up and made it very interesting um, I mean everything even I, I remember him going toe-to-toe with Jack Nicholson and Wolf and he's just he's just got such a a great character in that. I mean, very cutthroat. It's um, Jack Nicholson's being uh, ousted by the latest Fresh Blood, and he's he's the I think he's the editor making all of these calls, um, and uh, it's, it's just a delicious voice and very very perfectly played. And you wonder how anyone else could ever have done that role, which is which is fitting really. I think uh, didn't he get replaced in? Um, was a film where it recently where he got he, he he didn't get replaced he replaced Kevin Spacey uh, because they digitally created a Kevin Spacey and at the last minute they stuck him in Christopher Plummer in there and um, and he you couldn't think of anyone else doing that part he seems like that kind of actor and, and it's it's a, it's a shame that he's passed he had, had a relatively good innings though didn't he yeah I oh, know ninety three. A 93 active all the way to, well, not all the way, uh, but, you know, to, to, to within a relatively short time at the end of his life. You can't argue with what he got done. Um, so, yeah. Um, and, and as I say, the, the, the old, the, is he the oldest person or just oldest man to win an Oscar? I think he's the oldest person to, to win an Oscar. Oldest mm, yeah. actor. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, it's not, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's an, an inspiring example to those of us who are resigned to working until we die. Um, so uh, that, 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 that's good. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm weirdly, I'm in terms of the, the limited subset of films I watch. There's not not as many things where I'm, I'm uh, you know fully fully clear on on you know where he stands out and stuff. But look, I was looking back. I was doing a post with us and looking back at his work on IMDb after he died. Right. Good. And um and yeah, it, it's a it's a hell of a body of work. And as you say, and there's very few examples of just clearly doing something because he needed the money. But it's, isn't it funny though that the the films that actors of his ilk uh, are most famous for are the ones that they hate the most. He absolutely detested the sound of music. Well, he didn't he like it. Taste. 
and then and then you had the likes of Alec Guinness, who absolutely detested Star Wars. You know, yeah. these are films that you know probably got them their widest audience uh, and and made them you know, household names. I mean, obviously Alec Guinness was famous long before Star Wars, but you know, I mean, it opened him up to a whole new yeah. uh, audience. You know, um, so it, it's funny that actors are like that. But he, yeah, he will be missed and a great body of work. Um, Right, so other TV uh, or film news, Kaz? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this was already announced, but Falcon and the Winter Soldier is creeping up on us, 19th of March, um, which, is, which is exciting to look forward to, particularly um, given that we're, you know, over halfway through, I think, WandaVision now. And yes, I have fin- finally caught up. Um, I, I think... Uh, that's about all the film and TV news. If you want to okay. give mentions to all the bad stuff, then then uh, the Equalizer has um, started. Uh, oh what well, Edward Woodward? But no, the is that a reboot? Is it? Yeah. Oh dear. Uh, yeah, the the Equalizer TV series. I enjoyed the um, I enjoyed uh, going back to film scores, the Denzel Washington scores for those. I can't remember who did those, but the first one, especially that walking around a supermarket, listening to that on earphones gives you an added sense of purpose. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, Yeah, the score to Man on Fire, I think, is tremendous. But the Equalizer reboot is with Queen Latifah. So, um, so that uh, I thought I thought everyone would already know that, but yeah, that's that's the big shock on that one. And they're already doing um, they're also doing a a TV series called Clarice. They haven't got the rights to Silence of the Lamb, so they can't mention any of the events in it. But uh, it's going to be the character. Um, I mean, there's so there's so much of this stuff coming thick and fast. It's the only reason yeah. I do the podcast; I can keep up to date with it. it <laughs> so doesn't not, I mean, neither of them look like <laughs> things that they're going to die like that. Uh, Bad Boys spin-off, LA's Finest. I think they're just going to they're going right. to get a you know second season just because if you ditch it after one, no one will even watch that one. So you have to you have to give it a second season and then kill it slowly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, pointless talking about disc reviews and and so on because there's no no new discs. Well, I think that's uh, quite this, interesting, so. isn't it? Because uh, there's there's been a few releases announced, but it's a really really odd bunch of movies. And and I and I was gonna say I have to say only about half of them are ones that I'd really shoot for. I mean, we got uh, Arrow releasing Demons One and Two. We got the Disney. Um, uh, animated movie classics coming which have been out in the US already Jojo Rabbit finally getting a 4K release I mean I've been waiting for that for no I haven't um, and Gattaca <laughs> Gattaca's getting a release I'm looking forward to that Wonder Woman 84 nope uh, Ten Commandments which will look spectacular uh, Godzilla no Donnie Darko Arrow Battle Royale Arrow. I mean, there'll be nice. It's been a there. long time since I've seen niche. Donnie Darko. Yeah, a I mean, long time since I've seen that. And and you know, we mentioned Heat and Speed, which is a way away. And already Disney, I think that r- the rumor is that well, that Disney was one are... exciting sounding film there. Heat and Speed. Heat and speed. <laughs> <laughs> Disney are um, pulling heat because of technical problems. Is the rumor. So um, so that'll be a real disappointment because it's possibly the best out of all of those. So, so I, well, I mean, I, I guess it has to be catalog stuff at the minute because uh, you know cinemas have been closed for a long time now. They, mm-hmm. they haven't been shooting anything new, really. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's fine, but why not? Why not release more catalog stuff? I mean, this is this is this takes us to May, mid May. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's there's nothing, nothing significant in terms of quantity. Well, it's because you, you've got streaming services, cars where you do, yeah, a lot of a lot of. You know, a lot of investment. That's where it's head now. In certainly Disney, they've yeah. made they've made no uh, you know denying of the fact that that's where they're going to push. Yeah. Yes. And, and where and they're going, so. and see where they put their money with uh, with One Division for those who stuck with it. I, I've stuck with it, and I've got to say, I I'm absolutely loving it. I think it's uh, I think it's now that we're getting somewhere with it. Now that we, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're starting to figure things out and starting to put the pieces didn't, together. I mean, you, you didn't. You, I, so look, coming as someone who hadn't watched any in order and had stayed away from all the discussions mm-hmm. on it, um, I watched two one night and then two another night and then the fifth one yesterday. 
So watch them in quite quick succession. I'm very surprised people turned this off. I find it really obvious right from the outset, given what you know about the characters that are in it, that something very interesting is going on. Yeah, but I think because the first two episodes came out um, on their own, unless you are somebody who... Uh, has seen, seen the other films? No, yeah, it knows the MCU and so on, and, and it has a, an interest in possibly the comic side as well. Maybe there's a bit more insight there because because I think people who were casual, like myself, MCU, uh, you know, not I'm not a huge fan, although I really enjoy the stuff and I watch it. Um, I can see why people switched off. I can see why people didn't get the joke. Um, okay, but but so, I mean, you, you must have seen like you've seen the MCU, and so you're yeah. casual, but you've seen the MCU, so given what you know about vision at the end of the mcu yeah 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 so i suppose for me just that fact alone means that wonder vision yeah. I, I just think i just think the way it was presented i i, I quite like the fact I, I quite i agreed with steve's um last week when, when he was like well if they'd actually done bits of four in the first episode just to give it a little bit of a, because you, you had a few little hints and you knew something wasn't right. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you knew it was going to go somewhere. It was just, I guess, after the first two episodes, because they released those on their own, I think that's maybe, I think people were expecting a reveal a little bit quicker than they actually did get. Yeah. And, and maybe, that. and maybe watching it the way you've watched it, Kaz, it, it's not as. No, it isn't as painful. It's not as to painful. Yeah. 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 I just, uh, I, I I'm just surprised that after two, episodes, I have to be honest. The chances so are I I, I might. I, I mean, I I gave it a brief a, a cursory look and, and and left it, but that was mainly because there were things elsewhere, it, uh, records and stuff had turned up, so I just cracked on with those instead. <laughs> I mean, Ed, well, no, you but, you have to be a fan of the MCU to no really, no no. Really I have like seen. It. I am. A, I have worked out. I have seen enough of it to know. I, it wasn't that I stopped watching because it, it didn't interest me. Okay. It was like at the uh, I. I had every suspicion um, that, uh, whereas actually uh, I, I, I have uh, often made uh, a defense of, of stuff coming out weekly, I figured with this one, I actually, give, especially given the relatively short, short length of some of the early episodes, if nothing else, that I actually needed a couple of them in one place to then bang through mm. and take it from there. So I will watch WandaVision. Um, uh, and and I, I'm confident I've seen enough of them to have a, a vague. Well, I think if you've on. seen Ultron, Infinity War, and Endgame, yes, and I've, and I've seen some others beside. Yeah, no, um, but I just mean if that yeah. for anyone going into it, if they're familiar with those three, they're they're in a pretty secure place. Yeah. So yeah, I'm. Um, no, I'm. I, 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 it was more the the nature of it. It just for for obviously I I completely understand Disney feeding it out week by week but it's something where actually i'd rather have a couple of uh, there's probably enough episodes there now for me to make a go of it so um yeah maybe maybe will. two a week would have would have worked better for no, people because no, i can no, see it, the no, if it's the most expensive isn't it the most expensive serialized television thing ever made yeah you see where the money's gone yes uh, well absolutely but nevertheless if you've done that you don't you don't drop that anything faster than what they're doing Mm. There are oh, yeah. commercial real there's commercial realities to this as well. So. Yeah, I mean that that's something uh, I I I like the Netflix model, but at the same time with with really popular stuff like Stranger Things, I would have thought that they would have gone for weekly, uh, even if it was just two episodes a week. I thought they would string it out a bit more just to just to keep people interested up, and, yeah. and keep mm. people talking about it. And, and it uh, also generates when you can't have water cooler moments when there's someone in your circle who sat down and just. You know, binge uh, binged the whole thing with yeah, with their eyes propped open with toothpicks. And so, then, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, the end of season, uh, the end of episode five of One Division is a water cooler moment. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yes. And one, and, uh, but one of the things that made the Mandalorian stick was that ability to generate a bit of water cooler. Yeah. And and mm. and actually, do you know what? Uh, tragically, in twenty twenty one, it's not water cooler moments because none of us are around a water cooler. Mo but it's the it's the the little the the buzzlets on Twitter. It's the people memeing various bits and bobs and stuff that's come out of it and so on and so forth. And One Division is doing that. 
Um, and uh, I'm acutely aware that the more I say one division, I keep saying it's one division. One division. division. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. uh, it's, what, what it's like it? it's like that um, when uh, going back to the podcast from years ago to uh, to get one direction to appear correctly on that <laughs> cinema, they had to type it in as one w a n d erection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Greg, you've been watching one division. No, I've I only just signed up to Disney Plus about two days ago. Um, oh, well, you've got lots of stuff to do. I know. Yeah, I've because I've, I've got all the MCU stuff on disc. I've not really bothered, but since they're um, releasing this star, is it Star? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All 20, that. 20 thought, that. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, and they've got the offer on um, the twenty pound cheaper um, until I think it's yeah until it comes out later this month. So I thought I'll I'll take the plunge. So, yeah, I've got a lot to get through. I, I mean it when I say it. I think at the moment it represents the best value streaming service of the lot. Mm. Uh, so, yeah. And that's not simply because I can just binge watch endless I've got to see, The Simpsons. I've got to say, I always slag Prime off, but um, the content-wise, there's a lot of good content on there at the minute. It seems to be a, a lot of uh, film content turning up on there quite quickly after uh, the home release window. So, mm. Uh, no, 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 of... it's, it's just searching it so maddeningly. Well, one one maddening. thing I have noticed that over the last few weeks as well with Prime is uh, the 4K stuff is a lot easier to find. That's um, and it's certainly coming up a lot easier in the uh, you know as you're scrolling through. Because if the Prime is a lot smaller in the left-hand top corner, it's UHD. That's the easiest yeah. way to find it. So, um, so yeah, I've noticed that recently. And, and there's lots of stuff on Prime that I've been watching recently. So... Um, so are, are you going to get into uh, one division or are you going to do Mandalorian first, Greg? Uh, well, I'm, I don't know who uh, Sam Ronnie, but I'm not too much of a Star Wars fan. <laughs> so I, I, I watch it. Well, but... thanks for coming to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's been good having you on the, the last two episodes. Yeah, it's a shame that you won't be on anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a Trekker or Trekkie or Trek, whatever you want to call right. it. So, so you'll be um, the press of it at the minute then with the way Star Trek's going. Yeah, well, no, I actually like um, Discovery. Oh, um, my God. I, Good God. <laughs> I'll have uh, what you're having. I also actually, yeah, and I also actually like Picard as well. So, um, yeah, but no, I, I'll, I think one division first, for sure. Fair enough. Okay. Well, no, that's fine. I mean, I adored The Mandalorian, but again, that's, um, that's as much an example of... Um, in some regards, it doesn't necessarily matter about it being Star Wars universe as much as actually just getting some decent people together, scoring it correctly, and just doing a nice Western in yeah. space. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that score is fantastic. I, it's a shame that I, uh, it's only the theme that I can find anywhere. It's, uh, no. it's a that has it. No, it's not an album, is that? Oh, you're just on the wrong streaming service, Phil. If you're a Koba subscriber, there is an actual separate release for every single Mandalorian episode. Is there really? There okay. is, yes. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's moot because I'm afraid the only thing you need the is you need the main score. Just the simple business of sitting in a car, turning it on so the music starts, and then just you know starting the engine and driving off to the Mandalorian. It just makes anything you do <laughs> eight million percent more exciting. Yeah, yeah, good. Right. So to wrap up on the podcast, what have been how what what have been watching? Um, no change for me because I'm still trying to get through the expanse. So I'm almost finished season two there. I'm doing two and eight. So when I can do two and eight, I'm doing two and eight. So I'm hoping to get caught up quite quickly on that one. Lots of other things that I want to watch, but I'm going to get that uh, finished first. There's that documentary uh, on BBC Four uh, that's worth watching about the film scores and, and how they produce them and so on. I mentioned it earlier on. Uh, I'd recommend that. Kaz, what you've been watching apart from stuff you've been reviewing? <laughs> no, that's. That's pretty much it. It's non-stop. I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm watching Yellowstone because, and I am reviewing it, but I mean, um, it's a lot to catch up on because season one and two drop in the UK next month in one go. Uh, they're up to, I think season four is coming out this year in the US. So we're way behind. It's Costner. And it's uh, the, the guy who's show running it. It's the guy who did uh, Wind River, uh, Taylor Sheridan, and um, it's really good. It's it's Costner's version of, I guess, Succession, um, with cowboys, modern day cowboys. Um, it's it's really it's definitely worth checking out. Anyway, I'll save that for the review closer to the time. But if it's not that, it's catching up on One Division and it's all the other review stuff that comes through. Yeah, good stuff, Greg. 
Um, Cobra Kai, I've started nice. watching, um, which is a bit hard going for the first sort of half of the season, um, but it sort of gets into it. And if you're a fan of um, the Karate Kid, it's you know it's got loads to keeps going back to that. So yeah, I'm enjoying that at the moment. Yeah, I'm going to start that. I'm actually going to watch uh, Karate Kid again because it's been probably 15, 20 years since I've last a while. seen it. So uh, I'm going to watch the film first, then get into uh, the series, I think. Uh, I think I'll do it that way. Ed, what have you been watching? Um, I <laughs> Don't judge me. I've been plowing through many episodes of Police Interceptors on the Channel 5 catch-up because, one, there's actually <laughs> very few adverts. Uh, I enjoy the catching of scallies. Um, and uh, I've been enjoying the episodes which have got my car. Uh, Nottinghamshire Police uh, actually have two of them as there are marked police cars. So that's been quite satisfying to watch as well because uh, it would appear that they're capable of quite impressive acts of thuggery. <laughs> so, yes, that's what I've been watching. Right, OK. Uh, podcast competition cars. <laughs> got all the windows in the world open. <laughs> All right. He's just having to shut some, porno- shut some pornography down first. He's fine. <laughs> uh, let's have a look here. So, um, the podcast competition is to win a copy of Tin Star Liverpool on Blu ray. That's the last, the final season of Tin Star. And to win a copy of this on Blu ray, use the following question to select the correct answer from the competition page Tim Roth played Mr. Orange in which of the following? movies oh that's dead easy how many have got it wrong yeah it's 80 percent have got it wrong <laughs> really? so, yeah but that's again without they any don't context, know the question i <laughs> don't know the question all of the answers could be great answers so uh, yeah it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's one of those things where a little bit of patience goes on <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i'm gonna say because Maybe maybe you should put the competition up on the morning of the podcast. That might be a bit. <laughs> so you just, think just, it's easy, just, easy just yeah, I think just for people who uh, you know they're too quick on the on the button. We're yeah, saving yeah. people from themselves. The people yeah. who uh, dropped out of watching One Division after the first ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. Oh, no, oh look, it's gone up to fifty percent. Yay! Unless someone just suddenly got in there. We've got 50% correct answers, you guys. Well done on guessing the correct answer of three possible options. <laughs> right. Um, I think that's about it for tonight. Yeah. Well, thanks to Ed Selly. It is very cold in space. Greg, who? To the last, I will grapple with thee. And Kasalu. I haven't faced death. I've cheated death. If you enjoyed the podcast, then please give us a like and subscribe to the channel. Plus, hit the no- notification bell. You know what it does, so just hit it. Uh, we also can publish... someone press the like button because we're on forty nine, and it's a number that aggravates my OCD. Can someone yeah. press the fifty? Yeah, please like the button. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, like... now we got to fifty one. Well, I, I did it as well, Ed. Sorry. Oh, we're fifty. There we go. Now. There we go. We're fine. We're good. We're good. We're fine. <laughs> Um, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. You can put back every forums.com for latest reviews, news, uh, and videos. Of course, you can also leave us a five star rating if you listen later in the week uh, via the service that you listen to the podcast on. If they let you uh, give us a rating, then please do that. Uh, only if you enjoyed the show, though. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for joining us. And remember that the movies podcast is on Monday, the 15th. And it start. I'm just checking. I got my date right there, and it starts at half past seven. So join us for that. It is the first one. Um, so we'll see you on Monday night. I might join as the audience just for a laugh. <laughs>